started. Enough with that. Okay, so <clears throat> quick recap on the philosophers we've talked about so far. I'm going to point to them, you tell me about them. Thales, what's Thales famous for? Water. 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 Everything is water. So he's the one who kicks off philosophy. He's the one who starts saying, there's got to be one stuff that makes up everything. And he thinks that that one stuff is water. Everyone likes what Davies trying to do here, trying to explain everything in the universe in terms of one stuff making it all up. Otherwise, how could it be that we could take some material and turn it into some other material? How is it that cows can turn grass into milk unless that milk was somehow already in the grass? So they must somehow be connected by the same underlying stuff. So everyone loves what Davies is doing here. They just hate his answer. He says it's water. What does an Aximander say? Well, it's a combination. Almost. That's down here. Oh. It's it's a water. cylinder. He thought the earth was a cylinder, but what did he think the one stuff was? A parallel. The boundless, the indefinite, the infinite. That's what it is. Yeah, it's all this one stuff, but guess what? It's everywhere. You can't experience it. You can't know about it. There's no experience you can have of it. But trust me, it's everywhere. And Aximander, or Anaximenes took issue with that. He said, nice try, Master, but you're not really telling us anything. You're saying, yeah, it's all connected, but we can't know how. That is essentially what you're saying. So he piggybacks on him. Let's say it's the most, uh, it, it's the stuff that's most like what he's saying. And so he decided it was air. And so he's our air guy. He's trying to get for this indefinite uh, a Puron that his master was talking about, but actually make it a physical substance. Is he the one that had the condensation? Yes. So he's a rarefication and condensation guy. So how do you change from one element to the next? You either add heat or you cool it. You rarefy it or you condense it. And that's how we make our transition from one substance to another. Okay, Xenophanes. Was it he the four elements? Nope. For None of these are four elements. Yeah. Xenophanes was water and earth. Now remember, he's what? the religious one. Oh. He's the theologist one. And so he's also the one that says, y'all is God and God is all, and everything is God. Yeah. God can't change whatever. And so, change. yeah. Yeah, he seemed to be in this weird position where, in the, one interpretation you can say he's saying it's water and earth, Another interpretation, it seems like he's saying everything is God and God is everything. And really, it's just this one God that underlies everything. Yeah. So, two ways of interpreting, interpreting him there. We're going to notice how Parmenides sounds a bit like this guy. So, one of the speculations is he's the teacher of Parmenides. So, for the upcoming lecture, he's the most important out of these guys so far to talk about. He's also important. He's also important. Okay. So, that was Xenophanes. Now, Heraclitus. Fire. fire. He said fire. That's one thing. But more importantly, he said change. So what some people interpret him as fire, I think the one that's most accepted and the one that history interprets him as saying the most is change. Nothing is, everything is becoming. Nothing is. He's the one that says there are no entities. Nothing actually exists in reality. There's no entities. There's no you. All that exists is becoming. There is no being. There is no exists. There is only becoming. Nothing is. Everything is becoming. I don't understand. Okay. <laughs> well, you'll have to go back and review our lecture on Heraclitus because we can't recap it again. But the sentence you have to remember for him is nothing is, everything is becoming. Okay, and then finally we got to Pythagoras. What did Pythagoras think the one stuff was? Mathematics. Numbers. Numbers. The, uh, oh, yeah. the Tetractus is yeah. somehow creating everything, right? And everything comes back to the Tetractus. He's also a cult leader. Yeah, he's also the cult leader one. He's the weird guy. But he starts his Pythagorean school, and we're going to notice that a lot of philosophers after Pythagoras are or were at some point Pythagoreans. It's a great access of information. Prior to Thales, he's the only other great mathematician on this list. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of your philosophical thinkers, we're going to see a heavy Pythagorean influence from him. Now, in particular, we're going to be talking about Parmenides today and his followers. So these are the two guys that influence. He's going to sound a lot like these guys. And Parmenides is unequivocally targeting Heraclitus. He hates this guy's philosophy. He's going full out attack on this philosophy. And after this, philosophy is viewed as Parmenides versus Heraclitus, the great clash. So that's where we're going, Parmenides. Uh, any questions on any of these guys before we get started? <laughs> yes, Pythagoras supposedly. Pythagoras supposedly proved the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagoras supposedly proved that the square root of two is irrational. 
Now it's hard for us to distinguish between what Pythagoras did and what his Pythagorean followers did. It's hard to make that distinction because they were very secretive and they were always attributing things to Pythagoras. But it came from that school. It definitely came from these guys. These Pythagoreans is where a lot of mathematics is being developed prior to uh, Plato's academy being established. It's largely the Pythagoreans developing mathematics. So yes. Uh, any other questions about any of these guys? Okay. So now we start with Parmenides of Elia. Born, when was he born? We don't know. When did he die? We don't know. So 475 BC, that is called his fourth. He was flourishing in this year. We know he was alive and kicking in 475 BC. That's what we know about. Uh, let's see, why did I want to show you this map? For Elia. For Elia, probably just showing you where Elia is. So now we're talking about the Italian philosophers over here. Uh, remember, Xenophanes, he started out over here, but he ended up over here in Elia. Mm -hmm. So that's why Xenophanes is going to have that influence. Pythagoras started over here in Samos, but he ended up over here in uh, Croton and Metapontum. So that's why he's able to have a big influence here in Italy. So that's why we're going to see those two largely uh, having a large impact on, impact on Parmenides. Okay, so starting with Parmenides. He was likely a Pythagorean for some time, and he might have also been a pupil of Xenophanes. Those are the two things speculated. Now, he's the first person that we have to support his position with reasoned argument. Now, some say he's also the father of logic. And we're going to see why people say that, but in short, he's the first one explicitly using a logical argument to prove something. And the argument that he's going to be using is a reductio ad absurdum argument, proof by contradiction, for those of you who have seen that. Uh, a lot of how we're able to date him is because there's a dialogue of Plato's titled Parmenides. And this dialogue centers around Parmenides and his pupil Zeno visiting Athens and having a conversation with Socrates. The conversation is supposed to have happened, I can't remember the ages, but there's something like Parmenides is supposed to be like 60-65, Zeno is supposed to be like 40-45, and Socrates is supposed to be like 20. So that gives you a sense of the gap between these guys. So Socrates is now overlapping Parmenides' life a decent amount. And uh, there's good reason to believe that this conversation actually happened. Not the way that Plato recorded it, but odds are the event actually happened, and Plato just used the event as one of the scenes for his dialogue. So you can read the Parmenides if you want. It's not very much about Parmenides. It's actually Plato being critical of his own philosophy. But it does have some history in there that might be interesting. But that's one of the ways that we're able to date him. How we come up with that 475 BC number. Um, we have far more of Parmenides' actual works than any of the other philosophers we have mentioned thus far. In particular, one of his poems. We have a ton of one of his poems. I suggested to you all to go and look into that poem yourself prior to coming to this class. So that you can get a feel for this poem. And so we're going to actually see a good chunk of the poem here. Obviously, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Just trying to pick out pertinent chunks to give you a feel for his argument. Now, in preparation for understanding his poem and the arguments he's going to make in his poem here, uh, we need to review uh, the law of contradiction and then a type of proof style. So what is the law of contradiction? The law of contradiction says Contradictory propositions cannot both be true in the same sense at the same time. E.g., the two propositions, P is the case and P is not the case, are mutually exclusive. One of them has to be true, one of them has to be false. They can't both be true. That's impossible. It can't both be the case that I am wearing a black shirt and I am not wearing a black shirt. One of those is true, one of those has to be false. We typically symbolize this with the tautology, not P and not P. So P and not P is always false, not false is always true. So it is never the case that you can have both P and not P. That's what that's saying. Make sense? Okay, that's the law of contradiction. So why is he considered the father of logic? Some say because he is explicitly using this. He didn't call it the law of contradiction. Aristotle's going to be the first one to do that. Aristotle's actually the father of logic, setting up these things, uh, setting up logic for the first time. But he's actually using this thinking explicitly. He's saying we can't allow this to happen. We can never have both P and not P. So that's why he's sometimes called the father of logic. <laughs> now, the proof style that Parmenides is going to use in his poem. The proofs used by Parmenides are reductio ad absurdum proofs. 
reductio ad absurdum. What's a reductio ad absurdum proof? This is just a Latin phrase, and it means reduced to an absurdity. If I show that your position can be reduced to some absurdity, your position must be false. That's the logic of the argument. These are proofs by contradiction in mathematics. So those of you who have done some math classes, you're very used to proof by contradiction. You show that something being true leads to some absurdity, i.e. contradiction, therefore it must be false. And go ahead and marry away. That's exactly what he's going to do here. So he shows that assuming some premise to be true implies that some statement P is both true and false. But P can't be both true and false. That's absurd. And so he shows that assuming some premise to be true implies P is both true and false. And so that statement must in fact be false. So according to the law of contradiction, it is impossible for a statement to be both true and false. Therefore, the premise we assume to be true must actually be false. That's the style of his proofs here. We feel like we got big picture how he's going to make these arguments. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to give two small examples just to give you a feel for these types of proofs before we try to with all Parmenides' language. Okay, we're going to do proof by contradiction. I claim that my commute to work is five minutes. We're going to show that this is impossible. I'm lying. We're going to prove me wrong. So we do that. Now, I, say my, I claim my commute to work is five minutes. You pull up on your phone, my house, and where I work, and you see, actually, those are 25 miles apart. You do a little bit of math, and you realize that I must drive 300 miles per hour in order to do that in five minutes. You look up the specs on my car, and you see that my car tops out at 120 miles per hour. So, contradiction. My car can't go over 120 miles per hour, and my car must go over 20, 120 miles per hour if I get to work in five minutes. So this assumption has led to an absurdity. Therefore, this assumption must be false. Therefore, my commute to work is not five minutes. That was a false statement. <coughs> Let's try one with a little bit more rigor, common one for mathematics. I'm going to prove that there is no largest number. So let's assume by way of contradiction, or let's just look at the claim, there is a largest, largest number, we'll call it x. Well, then, we'll let y equal x plus 1. x is a number, 1 is a number, a number plus a number is a number. So y is a number. And y is equal to x plus 1. So y is a number, and it's a number greater than x. So then we get y is not greater than x, because x is the greatest number, and y is greater than x, because y is greater than x. Contradiction. Therefore, there is no largest number. Assuming there was a largest number led to an absurdity, a contradiction. Therefore, there is no largest number. That's the style of proof. OK. Any questions on that? Or are we ready to get into this poem? Ready. We're ready for the poem? Yeah. All right, let's jump to the poem. So we have uh, several large portions of his poem, and good reason to believe we know the order that they all go in. So a lot of information about Parmenides, a lot of direct information. The poem is pretty much split into three parts. We have the introduction, and then the part of the poem that's often called concerning truth, and then the part of the poem that's called concerning opinion. Those are the three pieces. This is the part of the poem we care the most about. This is where most his philosophy that people cares about resides is in this part of the poem. And fortunately, this is also the part of the poem that we have the most of. So we got lucky with history this time. So we're going <laughs> to give you a taste of the introduction, spend pretty much all our time here, and then give you a taste of concerning opinion, and then that will be what we cover at part minutes. So almost all of what people are talking about when they talk about uh, the philosophy of Parmenides comes from the concerning truth section. <coughs> uh, this is also a section we have the most fragments of. And one more thing to note before we reach this poem. The way Greeks view change still. Remember, the way, Greeks, the way change is viewed, change is viewed as generation and destruction. Something coming into existence while something else is simultaneously going out of existence. You have what is becoming what is not, and what is not becoming what is. Remember, Tim the caterpillar. Starts out caterpillar, he becomes a butterfly. We had the caterpillar go out of existence, while the butterfly simultaneously came into existence. So the Greeks think about all change at this point as generation and destruction. Something, any time a change occurs, something went out of existence, at the same time something else came into existence. So generation and destruction is our terminology for change. Make sense? Okay. And with that, let's jump into the intro of this poem, give you a feel for his poetic language here. 
<clears throat> the horses which bear me conducted me as far as desire may go, when they had brought me speeding along to the far-famed road of a divinity who herself bears onward through all things the man of understanding. Along this road I was born, along this the horses, wise indeed, bore me, hasting the chariot on, and maidens guided my course. All right, there's an introduction to the poem to give you a sense of his language. This is still far from the rigorous arguments of someone like Aristotle. We're still using very poetic language. Fortunately, after him, you get a hiccup with Empedocles, and the people are a lot more clear about what they're talking about. So we got two more poets to get to. Parmenides and Empedocles, and then we'll be back to sanity. Okay. But anyway, so it sets a scene here. Parmenides is uh, in a chariot. He is being escorted by the daughters of the sun through the gates of day and night to go see the goddess. Now, he's not describing some sort of vision. This is all meant to be just a metaphor. And he's personifying wisdom here. So he's, when he talks about a goddess in the poem, he's not talking about an actual goddess from Greek mythology. He's personifying wisdom. It's a common uh, literary device in uh, Western writings. When you're talking about an arbitrary individual, you use the masculine pronouns. When you're talking about an ideal, when you're personifying an ideal, you use the feminine pronouns. So if we were to personify justice, we'd talk about lady justice. If we were to talk about an arbitrary just person, we would call them a just man. So he's just personifying wisdom as lady wisdom here. So it's not an actual goddess being discussed. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's going to go have a conversation with wisdom. This is how he's learning. So here's wisdom talking to him. It is necessary for thee, so wisdom is talking to Parmenides. It is necessary for thee to learn all things. Both abiding essence of persuasive truth and men's opinion in which rests no true belief. But nevertheless, these things also thou shalt learn, since it is necessary to judge accurately the things that rest on opinion, passing all things carefully in review. So, setting up two parts of the poem. Wisdom is telling Parmenides, I'm going to teach you about two things. I'm going to teach you about uh, the abiding essence of persuasive truth. So, I'm going to teach you about truth with a capital T. How the way, the way the universe actually is. And on top of that, I'm also going to teach you the things that only rest on opinion. And so that's how the poem splits into two. The first part is where justice, or not justice, wisdom is teaching him about truth with a capital T. And the second part of the poem is where she's teaching him about the way of opinion. Men's opinions. Which isn't the same thing as this persuasive truth. They're actually very different to each, from each other. So Parmenides kind of wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to talk about the universe as logic says it should be. And at the same time, he also wants to talk about the universe the way you and I see it. Most people just care about the first part of what he said, not so much the second. So that's what he's saying up there. <laughs> so, for man, you should learn all things, both the truth and the opinions of men. Necessary to learn the opinions of men so that he may more accurately judge the things that rest on opinion. Good? So, now we're ready to jump into the part of the poem concerning truth. This is the part of the poem that we care about. I'm going to try and give you high level everything that's going to be discussed in the poem, and then we'll break it out piece by piece. So high level, what's going to happen? In short, we're going to discover that what is, is. What exists is what exists. What is, is. And what is not, is not. If something doesn't exist, it never exists. So what is, is. What is not, is not. And what is not can neither be, nor be thought about. Exactly. So he's going to be arguing against change. So you're already seeing ahead. Now, one part of this that you might think is a little bit weird, you might say, okay, maybe you see where some of this is going to go. The one weird thing you might think is weird is this, nor be thought about. He's going to say you can't think about what is. In short, he's going to say you can't think about nothing. Now go ahead and try and think about nothing. What do you think about? Nothing. Nothing? What's nothing? The word nothing, that's a something. Yeah. You think about empty space, that's empty space. I want you to think about nothing. Now, it's hard to get good intuition for nothing. <laughs> English is funny. So there's an interview I watched once that really helped with my intuition. So the, it's an interview with a man who used to have his sight and lost his sight. He went blind later in life. They have the interview, and the girl ends up asking him a question. What's the most surprising thing about going blind? And he explains... 
I want you to know, it's when you watch it, you, when you see it in the movies, the person as they go blind, everything goes dark. Everything goes black. I want you to know, it doesn't go dark. It doesn't go black. I don't see blackness. I don't see. I now see out my eyes what I used to see out the back of my head. I don't. He sees nothing. He sees what you see out the back of your head. Nothing. That is so weird. Aristotle had a cute way to talk about nothing. What's nothing? It's what rocks dream about. <laughs> nothing. That's nothing. That Not empty blackness space. No, nothing. Now think about nothing. That is so weird. That's hard to all right, so the concept for why Parmenides thinks that you can't think about nothing. <laughs> if it's thought, it has to be thought about something. Otherwise, it's not thought. Yeah. That's what Parmenides is. Okay, so once you got that, then he's going to go on to argue that what is is, and it is without beginning and end, it is universal, existing alone, immovable, and eternal as in timeless. And we're going to argue it has all these properties. So we'll give you the first line to uh, the concerning truth part of the poem. <laughs> Come now and I will tell thee, and do, thou, and do thou hear my word and heed it. What are the only ways of inquiry that lead to knowledge? The one way, assuming that being is, and that it is impossible for it not to be, is a trustworthy path for truth attendant. That's the good one. We like that path. The other, that not being is, and that it necessarily is, I call wholly incredible, as in not credible, a wholly incredible course, since thou canst not recognize not being, for this is impossible, nor couldst thou speak of it, for thought and being are the same thing. So he's setting you up, we have these two paths. There's the one path, assuming that being is, that's a good one, and then the bad path that people like Heraclitus have taken, assuming that not being is, that's a bad one. It's impossible to have not being is. So we're going to follow the right path and see where it takes us. So there's two different ways of inquiry. First, assuming that being is, and that's impossible for it not to be. Good path. The other, that not being is, and that necessarily is. This is what Heraclitus saw. That's a bad path. He's going to say, this is absurd, this is nonsense. We're going to follow this path and see what it tells us about the universe. Right? Okay. So far, you're probably on Parmenides' side. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So... We will use the first path of inquiry. We will make, uh, that should be two assumptions. We will make two assumptions and discover everything we can from these two assumptions. Our two assumptions will be one, that being gets. We're gonna assume being exists. It's gonna be one of our assumptions. What's the other assumptions that we're gonna think? What's the other assumption we're gonna make? That is impossible for not being to be. That's a contradiction, you can't have a contradiction. So these are our two assumptions, and we're going to see where it takes us. We're going to assume that being is, and that it's impossible for not being to be. Not being, being, not being. Not being, being, non-being. <laughs> so there's being, and then there's non-being. Being is, you can't have non-being. <laughs> if it is, it's being. <laughs> yeah. so, right? Is and being here are the same thing. Is being everything, you can kind of swap those interchangeably. Everything is. Being. Existing. Right? So Everything in existence. Being. Alright? That's what we mean by being here. Being is. It is what is. <laughs> okay. So there's our two assumptions. Let's see what we can argue about being. So we will prove being has some property by proving it is impossible for it to not have said property. In other words, we're going to show being not having a property, it leads to being, it leads to non-being, being. Sorry, that should be a comment. It leads to non-being, being, which is impossible. That's going to be our contradiction. Yeah. So we're going to assume being doesn't have some property. It's going to lead to non-being, being, a contradiction. Therefore, being must have that property. That's going to be the style of these proofs. So we're going to use these two assumptions to prove seven things. One, that being is. Well, that one's just one of our assumptions. So check, we got that one. Now we're going to prove that being is eternal, meaning without beginning or end. We're going to prove that being is without change. We're going to prove that being exists absolutely. We're going to prove that being is continuous. Being is unmoved. And then we're going to prove that thought and being are one and the same. Yeah, we're going to prove all these things. Okay. All right, here we go. Oh, before we go off, 
<laughs> Just thought it was kind of funny to throw this in here. Some of his thoughts about those who follow the other path. So we've got our two assumptions. We're going to see where that takes us. But he has a little bit of commentary for those following the other path. So about those who follow the second way of inquiry. <laughs> and from that course, also along which mortals knowing nothing wander aimlessly, <laughs> since helplessness directs the roaming thought in their bosoms. <laughs> and they are born on death and likewise blind, amazed, they're in a derogatory, he's using that derog in a derogatory way. Uh -huh. So, since helplessness directs the roaming thought in their bosoms, and they are born on death and likewise blind, amazed, headstrong graces. They who consider being and not being is the same thing, and not the same, and that all things flow a back-turning course. So that's what he thinks about the hair All right, so now we'll get to our proofs. Our first proof here. We're going to prove that being is eternal and without change, which is what he means by being is absolute, combining those two together. So I'll give you the piece of the poem that gives you a sense for this, and then we'll break down the arguments in uh, regular language. So, arguing that's eternal and without change. For what generating out, for what generating of it wilt thou seek it out? So, what will being come from? So, the it here that we're talking about is being. Okay. So, it references being. So, let me say it again. For what generating of it wilt thou seek out? From what did it grow and how? I will not permit thee to say or think that it came from not being. For it is impossible to think or to say that not being is. What thing would then have stirred it into activity that should arise from not being later rather than earlier? So it is necessary that being either is absolutely or is not. Nor will the force of the argument permit that anything spring from being except being itself. Therefore, justice does not slacken her fetters to permit generation or destruction, but holds being firm. All right, still very poetic language. We're trying to find justice a little bit there, right? So let's break down his argument, trying to keep the same logic he's using, but use our terminology. So he has a proof that being is eternal. How does that proof go? Go something like this. If being has a beginning, we're going to show that's impossible for being to have a beginning. Can't have a beginning. If being has a beginning, then what is there before being? So if being starts here, what's before being? You can't say it's being, so it has to be non-being. So non-being exists before being. And so non-being exists. And so you have non-being existing. Or non-being being. Contradiction. If being has a beginning, then what is there before being? It must be something that isn't being. And so it must be non-being. And so this would imply non-being being. This contradicts our assumption. And so being can have no beginning. Right. Similarly, if being has an end, what is left? All we have is non-being. Since being ended, all that's left is non-being. And so we get non-being being. This again contradicts our assumption, and so being can have no end. Therefore, being is eternal, without beginning or end. How does he prove that being is changeless? Or in other words, there's no change in the universe. In any change, we have what is not, non-being, becoming what is, being. And we have what is, being, becoming what is not, non-being. And so we get not being, being. A contradiction. You get not being, being, and being not being. Let's walk you through an example. Consider a seed growing into a flower. In the beginning you have a seed and not a flower. And in the end you have a flower and not a seed. Yeah. So in the beginning you have a seed and not a flower. So the seed is being and the flower is non-being. And in the end you have a flower and not a seed. So you have non-being, being. being. And being, non-being. You see that? Yep. Okay. And yet, you have the same thing that you started with when the flower grows. We don't replace the seed with a different flower. The seed actually changes into the flower. And so the flower and the seed both are and are not, which is impossible. Because you have the seed at the beginning and not the end. You didn't have the flower at the beginning. You didn't have it at the end. So the seed and the flower both are and are not. Both, Contradiction. Both are being at the same time. No, he's saying you have being becoming non being and non being becoming being. Yeah, but so how does he explain how a flower yeah, how did, yeah, pops out of the ground? Great question. <laughs> it doesn't. There is no change. He's arguing that there's no such thing as change in our universe. 
So what? You just want to see flowers grow? <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> being is changeless. We're saying if the flower, if the seed did actually grow into a flower, then you would have had being becoming non-being and non-being becoming being. So a seed never becomes a flower. As he explained So you didn't actually see it. This There's just kids that are. <laughs> no, there are no kids. There is no change. How are you? Do you look at it like? No change occurs in the universe. If you look at like the atomic level, so what's, how does he explain? Huh? How does he explain kids? Or well, he goes on in the way of opinion to explain how the world appears to us. But how the world appears to us and how the world really is are two very different things. Uh, so what are you saying? Is so there is no change. We can't. We're not. Perceived. You were never born. You were never dead. There is no time. Time is an illusion. Change is an illusion. You seeing different entities in this universe? Illusion, illusion, illusion. Okay, okay. There is no change. That's what he's arguing here. Right. When he's referring to changes, he's actually referring to something moving from one yeah, he's he's still still to another. Any change is conceived in terms of generation and destruction. But we'll see more arguments specifically against motion. But therefore, being is changeless. So what did we just argue? We argued that so here's the proof that being exists absolutely. What does he mean by absolutely? It's eternal without change. So this is just a quick corollary of what we already proved. We've already proved that being is eternal, and we've already proven proved that being is changeless. Therefore, being is eternal and changeless, which is what he means by absolute. So you okay. see, when he says being is absolute in the poem, he means it's eternal without any change. That's what he means. Okay. Proof that being is continuous. Here's a fun one. What do we mean by being is continuous? There's no holes in being. If you have, some, you can't have some being right here and some being right here. That's impossible. All being is continuous. One connected thing of being. You can't separate parts off. Nor is it subject to division. Nor is being subject to division. For it is all alike. Nor is anything more. Sorry. Nor is anything more in it, so as to prevent its cohesion. Nor anything less. But all is full of being. Therefore, all is continuous. Where being is contiguous to being. It's all right next to each other. No gaps, no holes. This is not one. I, I'm confused. All of being is continuous. Is he talking space. through time or is he talking through space? He's saying that all being is continuous. There's no gaps in being. Continuous so in what direction? So you can't have non being. <laughs> yeah. Let's go through it. If being is not continuous, so let's assume by way of contradiction that being is not continuous. If being is not continuous, there must exist two separate pieces of being. Here they are. Okay. Now, what exists in between these two pieces of being? Not not being. If you say that it's being between them, then they're not disconnected, and they're connected all by being. It's what is. It is. He is. So, like matter. Everything. What is not matter? <laughs> You're jumping ahead to language that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, and concepts. What did he mean? So there's being and there's yeah, non-being. And so you can't have being here and you can't have being you can't have being separated because then what exists between them? Nothing. Non-being. Nothing. So it doesn't right. exist. So you would have nothing between it. Yeah. So you would have non-being between it. It's so you have non-being is between it. There it is, right there. We can't have non-being is. Non-being is. <laughs> he already proved that non-being is so there must so yeah, if being is not continuous there must exist two separate pieces of being then what exists between these pieces of being it can't be being for then the two pieces would be connected and so it must be non-being let me help your intuition here oh, that makes sense. you say let's, let's say how you want to say it if I told you I have two objects and there's nothing between them you would think that the two objects are like that. Yeah. If they're going to be actually separated, then what's between them? If it's being, they're connected. So it has to be non-being. So the only way you get that they're separated is you have non-being exists between them. Impossible. But does separation even exist. exist in this weird area? Like if we're, no if we're not... That's he's important. arguing that there yeah. is no separation of being. You can't have some being here and some being here. It's all connected. There's no separating off two pieces of being. So air is being. Yep. Everything is being. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Your eyes are just deceiving you. You just don't see it. 
All right, so <laughs> we can't have two pieces of being. Uh, let's see. And so we get non-being. Being, this is a contradiction, because then you get non-being between them. Therefore, being is continuous. Does he believe has to be everywhere connected. Does he believe in like oneness? Yeah, he believes in oneness. He believes in the ultimate one oneness. We'll get to his oneness. He believes in oneness more than anyone I know. <laughs> All right. Proof that being is unmoved. That's his argument here. Farther, it, being being, farther, it is unmoved. In the hold of great chains, without beginning or end, since generation and destruction have completely disappeared, and true belief has rejected them. It lies the same, abiding in the same state, and by itself. Accordingly, it abides fixed in the same spot, for powerful necessity holds it in combining bonds, which restrain it on all sides. And you'll notice that word necessity popping up again. Same word from Greek mythology that we talked about in the beginning. The thing that's making everything happen. Over everything. How can anything happen? The thing that's over everything, I should say. What does it mean by unmoved? It, he's arguing against motion here. Oh, so nothing's ever moving. So here's breaking up the argument. Since being exists absolutely, it is not subject to any change. Right? Yeah. <laughs> motion is a type of change. Yeah. It's a generation and a destruction. If something moves from A to B, it both is and is not at point A. Contradiction. Therefore, being is motionless. <laughs> Zeno will give some more satisfying arguments against motion than Parmenides does. And then finally, his most interesting one, proof that thought and being are one. So actual being would exist, and your thought are actually one and the same. They're connected. That makes sense. So proof that being and thought are one. For thou, <coughs> for thou canst not separate being in one place from contact with being in another place. It is not scattered here and there through the universe, nor is it compounded of parts. Therefore thinking, and that by reason of which thought exists, are one and the same thing. For thou wilt not find thinking without the being from which it receives its name. Let's bring that up. Assume for a second that you could separate thought from being. Since you can't think about non-being, you can't think about nothing, we've already covered that, then all thought must be about something. It must be about being. So then the being of your thought will be separated from being. You'd have the being of your thought over here and being over here, if thought and being were two different things. So then all, sorry. Then all thought must be about being. So then the being of your thought would be separated from the being, from being, and so we would have being separated from being. However, we have already proved that being is continuous. Therefore, thought and being are one. So you can't even separate thought from being, because being is continuous, and all your thought has to be about being. It's the subject of all your thoughts. Also, thoughts not being. So even your thoughts are part of this being. Doesn't that mean that Everything is this one being. Doesn't that mean that anything you think about exists? Anything you think about is being. Your thought is part of being. Okay, so he gives some final comments in the poem concerning truth before his way of opinion. So a final comments on the way of opinion inside this part of the poem. Wherefore, all things will be but a name. All things which mortals determine in the belief that they, are tr that they were true, namely, that things arise and perish, that they are and are not, that they change their position and vary in color. All this change that people talk about is just that. All this change that people talk about is just that. It's just talk. It doesn't happen in reality. So talk about changes is nothing more than that. It's just talk. All change is discussed in the way of opinion and not the way of truth. So he wants to talk about change. He does that in his way of opinion part of the poem. But he really thinks that there's no such thing as change. So his poem concerning truth, the part of his poem concerning truth, he makes it clear that there is no such thing as change. But he also wants to talk about change. So he does that in the second part of his poem. I told you, Kathy wants to have this case. But I want to talk about it. Right, he's going to say, here's the way it is, but now we'll talk about the way it appears. So he's trying to do both. Uh, yeah, he's religious, I would say. You used to he kind of flashed through some. I kind of like that he kind of 
kind of has a Thank you. an abstract logical Spoke. conclusion about reality yeah. and then a yeah. actual experience yeah. of it. In, right, and he's just following ways. logic to the yeah. exact extreme. Yes. Wherever it takes so him, he's following his reason. And he's yeah. observing yeah. that just because he's experiencing it doesn't make it true. <laughs> well, it's not very good logic. It's <laughs> Remember, this is before the field of logic exists. Yeah. 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 We can cut him a little bit of slack yeah. compared to modern day people yeah. rejecting logic. Yeah. So is it? I forget which was. Is it for sure that he absolutely believed it, or is he just saying this is? You what can go is read his poem yourself, and you can read what his followers thought he said. But all the evidence points that he sincerely believes this. So we'll read one more little piece here to give you a sense of how he thinks about the whole universe, and hopefully after this you have a good sense of how uh, Parmenides pictures our universe. So he mentions that the universe is like a sphere at the end. But since there is a final limit, it is perfected on every side, like the mass of a rounded sphere, equally distant from the center at every point, for it is necessary that it should neither be greater at all nor less anywhere, since there is no not being which can prevent it from arriving at equality. Nor is being such that nor is being such that there may ever be more than what is in one part and less in another, since the whole is inviolable. For if it is equal on all sides, it abides in equality within its limits. So, how, how is it a sphere? How does he explain mountains? Say that again. How is he going to explain mountains? <laughs> You're thinking way too small. The whole universe is a... So, here's the way he seems to think about it. Oh, so, the universe for him is a finite, spherical, planum. No little gaps, holes, or empty spaces. Completely, evenly distributed. You can almost think about like a big metal spherical ball floating right there. That was just a picture for your head. Well, it also so, can't end because like otherwise there would be not Where is it sitting in? Hold on. Yeah, why is it and so the universe, in an analogy, is like a finite spherical planum of solid, eternal, unchanging being. Now, it's possible he's just using the surface of the sphere as an analogy, and he doesn't actually think it's a sphere. Because notice that a sphere doesn't have all its mass equidistant from the center. It's the surface of the sphere that has all its mass equidistant from the center. Yeah. So, he might have been using the surface of the sphere as an analogy. That's a, a massive contradiction for him to say that the universe is finite. It's not. No? Nothing contradictory about that. What's outside yes. of it? Yes. There is no outside of it. If there was, the universe is finite in size. It is what there is, and all there is is the universe. Not no, not and there's there's nothing there becomes outside outside of the universe. Universe. There is no outside the universe. Yeah, that's not there's it. the universe. That makes not be. So does he not believe in infinity? There is no infinite because infinite is indefinite is nothing. Oh, yeah. So he believes. Everything. <laughs> he believes everything is finite, and now when he believes that this uh, universe is eternal. He doesn't mean it as though it existed infinitely far into the past and exists infinitely far into the future. It's eternal as in it's timeless. It doesn't experience time. There is no time. There is no time. So the analogy is you think about this big solid sphere of stuff. Completely, perfectly distributed, solid stuff sitting there forever. No time, no movement, no nothing. Mm -hmm. That's our universe. <laughs> yes. Uh, have you heard about what it? Do you, you think of Heraclitus <laughs> as a uh, student who would have talked to people his whole life? Right. And so that's how he thinks of the universe. And so for Parmenides, what is the one stuff? Being. Being. The universe. It's all one. Everything is one. That's the one stuff. There's. It's not one stuff. It's one thing. That makes up everything. No, it's not everything's composed of water. Everything's composed of the one, because it is just the one. Isn't that a similar idea to a Piron? No. Except, except. A Piron has things coming into and out of existence. A Piron was this infinite, indefinite, can't really know anything about it, stuff. Oh, yeah. So in a sense, this is very opposite to a Piron. So how do we, what's his justification for us, us, and then us experiencing these? All an illusion. <laughs> how is it an illusion? It's opinion. We know it's an illusion. It's just, he's just following logic. Yeah. How do logic we is telling like, him. How do we think? It's an illusion. How do we think? We're being. If we're not, if we're not a separate. The way the universe appears to us, and the way it actually is, 
are two drastically different things. How does it appear at all, though? The, the the problem is, is his insane. assumption was wrong to begin He is just following wherever the logic of the argument takes him. His I mean, it's, right, it's often the case that our senses are deceived by things, right? How do we, how do we have this? This explains how I, how Einstein was able to predict things way before we even discovered them. Out in the universe was the very same process of logical deduction and reason. I mean, it's oftentimes that we find out we accept the universe is in some way very contrary to our senses. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, we just call it that. That happens all the time. And so these Greeks have no problem with accepting that the universe is very different from how it actually appears. And so it appears like there's time, it appears like there's change, it appears like all these things happen. It appears like people come and go, live and die, but no. There's just forever, solid, plain of a being. Always has been, always will be, is. Being. What happens when you die? That's just pathetic. Though. It being. is. Where do you go? You don't die. <laughs> it's like he's, he didn't want to come up with his own stuff, so he decided to cancel one stuff. This guy just did. He's just following the logic of the argument. That's all he's doing. Yeah, and I think it's quite solid with that reasoning. So he's, ex well, yeah, he's taking his two premises, <laughs> and he's tried to apply logic to those two premises, and these are all the conclusions that he came to. Well, his logic sound is his premises, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were his two premises? Being is. One of his premises is being is. You take issue with that? No. His other premise is that you can't have non-being existing. Well, we don't know. Yeah, we don't agree with that. You don't agree with that? I agree with change. Well, I, I didn't ask that. I asked, <laughs> do you think that's it possible for what is not to be? Why don't you guys try to disprove what is Is it saying? possible for non-being to exist? Yeah, to yeah. eventually come to person. He's also assuming that being is what's just just everything by the being. being. That's not an assumption. That's the conclusion he came to. He came to the conclusion that being was continuous. Yeah, that was the conclusion. He only made two assumptions. His two assumptions were, one, being is, and two, that you can't have, and the law of contradiction. You can't have not being, being. Those were his two assumptions. One, being is. Two, you can't have not being, being. There's his two assumptions. The problem is, I don't want to disprove that. <laughs> so, we'll go through, don't worry, we'll go through philosophical positions reconciling these two. Yeah, but he, it was a philosophy. But it's really hard to take issue with his two spark starting points. You can't deny it because if it's not on the case. All right. So, one more thing I want to point out. Notice what happens when we go back to our list of Pythagorean opposites. Which one of these it's two sounds like our universe? <laughs> elements. That's what I get, right? The one yeah. on the left. The one on the left. The our right. universe is this limited, <laughs> on, one, at rest thing. And so this is where we see a lot of his Pythagorean influence. Okay. <laughs> This was just a connection to what already existed with Pythagorean. Right. And they're evil. Just dark. showing you some of the evidence as to why some people think he was a Pythagorean. <laughs> so I just wanted to make that connection back. Okay. Now his poem concerning opinion. At this point, I cease from trustworthy discourse and the thought about truth. From here on, learn the opinions of mortals. He'll tell you about how the universe appears to you and about change and stuff like that. Hearing all the elusive order of my verses, men have determined in their minds to name two principles, but one of these they ought not to name. And in so doing, they have erred. They, dis they distinguish them as antithetic in character and give them, huh? What's antithetic? Opposed to each other. They distinguish them as antithetic in character and give them each characters and attributes distinct from those of the other. So that's his introduction to his poem concerning opinion as he's getting ready for the way of opinion. And he goes on to get, describe his cosmology, how the universe came into existence, that kind of stuff, which we don't care as much about. So we're not going to bother with that. This is our end of going over Parmenides' poem. You can read that part yourself if you want. Why do we care so much about the truth if the truth is wrong and the principles seem to be describing reality a lot? We care about the first part of his poem because that's the part that catches on. That's the part people take. And that's the arguments people use later to argue for the universe not having changed. So that's why we care about it. As far as his cosmology goes, it's no, it's not much different from what came before it. 
So there's nothing really original there. Wasn't he also the first one who started using logic in his argument? He's the first one to have an explicit argument. He's actually doing reductio ad absurdum arguments. Yeah. And he's saying, look, I'm going to show that holding this opinion leads to absurdity. Therefore, you can't hold this opinion. What was Heraclitus' um, argument for change? He didn't argue for change. He said, look around you. There's change. Therefore, logic must not work. Oh, right. Parmenides says, no, no, no. We have logic. <clears throat> Therefore, change must not work. Yeah. <laughs> so they're on opposite sides yeah. of this battle. What do we have? Logic or change? What are we going to go with here? Seems like we got to pick one or the other. So that's the dichotomy that we have just barely set up. What do we get from Parmenides? Parmenides says, what is, is. What is not, is not. And what is not can neither be nor be thought about. That's Parmenides if we sum him up in one line. What's Heraclitus if we sum, sum him up in one line? Nothing is. Not being is. Not being, nothing is. It exists. It actually is. What is? Nothing. There are no entities. That's what exists. <laughs> Completely opposite from Parmenides. What is, is. What is not, is not. Heraclitus says, no, nothing is. And everything is becoming. There is no being. There is only becoming. The change. There's only change. There's only change. Nothing is. Everything is becoming. What's changing? There is no being. There is only non-being. It's a non-being of becoming. That kind of non-being. So these are the two people arguing against each other. In a sense. So here's where they seem to agree. They both agree that change implies a contradiction. How does Heraclitus agree with that? How does Heraclitus change? Oh, as long as Heraclitus is there for logic. Heraclitus is the one that says nothing is, everything is becoming. He literally says everything is changed. He says everything is changed. And then he says... <laughs> this, here's exactly what he says. There's his quote. So why are you saying he implies contradiction? The change implies contradiction. They both agree with that premise. Both Parmenides and Heraclitus agree that change implies a contradiction. That's where they're both on the same side. So they both agree that change implies a contradiction. However, they come to opposite conclusions. Heraclitus says change is obvious. And so contradictions must exist. Oh, Parmenides okay. says the law of contradiction is obvious, and so changes must not occur. Yeah. So Parmenides says there's no change. Logic works. Heraclitus says no, there is change, and logic doesn't work. That's where they seem to be agreed. <laughs> now, another place that they both seem to be agreed, as pretty much every philosopher will be until we finally get to Aristotle, <laughs> they both seem to agree that the senses deceive us. You can't trust your senses. Heraclitus is saying there are no entities. There's nothing that actually exists. And Parmenides is saying there's no change. And yet we know that there are entities, and we know that there's change. We experience it all the time. So Parmenides claims that there is only the motionless, changeless, undifferentiated ball of being, but that's not the way it appears to our senses. We see things change. Heraclitus claims that the world is a constant flux and that nothing is. In other words, nothing exists. There are no entities. But that's not the way the world appears to us. We see entities all the time. So what are we going to do? How do we reconcile these two views? That's <laughs> Which one's which? Here's Heraclitus. Okay. Parmenides is over there. So we got Heraclitus and Parmenides. We got to figure out how to reconcile these two. And so later philosophers, later groups of philosophers, are going to try and whenever they set their philosophy, they always have these two in mind. They've got to answer both of them with their philosophy. So we're going to see the pluralist, and particularly the atomist, and we're going to see how they try to answer them both. We're going to get to the sophists, they're skeptics. Their answer is, well, we can't know anything. <laughs> we try to think this way, leaves a bunch of nonsense. We try to leave it this way, leaves a bunch of nonsense. We can't know anything. And everything's just your opinion. And there is no truth. There's just a truth for you right now. <laughs> and the truth for you right now might not be the truth for you a little bit later. <laughs> so there's your truth now. There's my truth now. They've just given up. They've just given up. <laughs> the skeptics. And then finally, we'll get to Plato and his answer to the question. But you'll definitely see how he has these two in mind. So later philosophies, later philosophers are largely working to reconcile these two views. They want their logic and their change too. I'm trying to get them both. <laughs> He's after, but he 
Now, before we go to any later philosophers, we're going to go over two followers of Parmenides who are going to argue his same position. So you're going to see more arguments in favor of Parmenides first from two more philosophers. Okay? So our next one is Zeno. Zeno of Elia, student of uh, Parmenides. His date is 595 to 530 BC. Thank you. I don't even know I said. 495 <laughs> to 430 BC. Prayer verse 7, where was wrong. So this is Zeno. Now, Zeno, he was also Pythagorean, and then he became a follower of Parmenides. Aristotle calls him the father of dialectic. He's the first one arguing to discover truth. And finally, we're going to see someone just talking and explaining their argument. It's lovely. No more poem. In particular, he supported Parmenides' position that motion and multiplicity are an illusion. Here's how it goes. So objectors had maintained that many absurdities follow from the position of Parmenides. Right? You say, oh, how do you explain this? How do you explain this? Parmenides, your position leads to all these absurdities. Here you were arguing by saying, we got an absurdity thinking one way, so we have to think another way. That's what Parmenides did, right? His proof by contradictions. Yes. So a bunch of people come after him, and they say, following your position, we get to all these absurdities. What do you mean? And so his student, Zeno, in defense of his master, Parmenides, he ends up showing that assuming Parmenides is wrong leads to worse absurdities <laughs> than assuming he's right. <laughs> so that's what he's out to do. He's so he goes friend. and he writes a book. It's a collection of roughly 40 arguments in defense of his master. And we get some of this history from uh, the Parmenides that Plato wrote, an actual dialogue with the name Parmenides. So if you read that dialogue, you get a little bit of this history. Because Socrates is making fun of Zeno a little bit. He's saying he wrote this work, but he really just stole all Parmenides' arguments. And Zeno explains, I wasn't trying to give new arguments. I was defending my master. People were saying that his positions lead to absurdities. I was showing the opposite of his positions lead to even worse absurdities. So he wasn't trying to come up with something new. He's simply trying to establish Parmenides, his master. So he wrote the book in defense of his master. So he's apt to argue on Parmenides' behalf here. Good? Yeah. So, wrote roughly 40. Uh, nine of these arguments are still extant to some degree. Enough of it that we can reconstruct what his argument was. We're going to go over just five of them. Okay? First one, titled The Dichotomy Paradox. Atlanta, she is a Greek heroine. So suppose Atlanta wishes to walk to the end of a path. He's going to argue that motion is impossible. Suppose Atlanta wishes to walk to the end of, the, of, of a path. Before she can get there, she must get halfway there. Before she can get halfway there, she must get a quarter of the way there. Before she can get a quarter of the way there, she must get one eighth of the way there. Before an eighth, one sixteenth, and so on. So in order for Atlanta to cross the path, Right? She's trying to get from here to here. Before she can get to here, she's got to get halfway. Before she can get halfway, she's got to get a quarter. Before she goes a quarter, she's got to go an eighth and a sixteenth, etc. We can keep doing that indefinitely. So, then to cross the path, she must travel an infinite number of distances in a finite time. If it takes Atlanta an infinite amount of time to get from the start of the path to the end of the path, then she never gets to the end of the path. So if she gets to the end of the path, she must do it in some finite amount of time. Now, how many distances does she have to cross if we can keep cutting them in half? She has to cover an infinite amount of distances. And she has to do it by that number of times. Now, pick a distance, doesn't matter how small, an infinite number of those distances is infinite. And so she has to cross an infinite number of distances in a finite amount of time in order to get from point A to point B. Impossible. It's even worse. Not only can she not get from point A to point B, she can't even get stuck. Started. Yeah. Because what's the first distance she goes? Before she can go the first billionth of an inch, she must go the first half a billionth of an inch. And before she can go the first half a billionth of an inch, she has to go the first quarter of a billionth of an inch. Not only can she not get to the end of the path, she can't even start on her path. Therefore, motion is an illusion. Doesn't happen. <laughs> motion is impossible. Can't happen, doesn't happen. <laughs> right. Calculus, not a thing yet. 
All right, probably his most famous one, Achilles and the tortoise, paradox. In a race, the quickest runner can never overtake the slowest, since the pursuer must first reach the point whence the pursued started. So that the slower must always hold a lead. How's this argument go? So we got Achilles racing a tortoise. Now Achilles is a gentleman. He's not just gonna charge off and beat the poor tortoise. He gives the tortoise a head start, right? Okay, so Achilles starts out here at point A, and the tortoise is at point B, when Achilles decides he's gonna start running. Now, by the time Achilles gets to point B, the tortoise must have gone some distance, because it's moving. So the tortoise must have gone to some point C. And by the time Achilles gets to point C, the tortoise, since it's moving, must have gone to some further point B. And by the time Achilles gets to D, the tortoise must have gone forward some distance to some point D, etc. And so Achilles can never pass the tortoise. Even worse, he can't ever even catch up to the tortoise. The tortoise is always ahead of him. That's Gamma Smith, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and so, change is an illusion. Motion is an illusion. Achilles can't pass the tortoise. It's impossible. Right? Right. Really. Let's do the arrow paradox. Let's test that. This is a fun one. <laughs> the language on this one's a bit hard, but I'll explain it. You'll understand. If everything, when it occupies an equal space, is at rest at that instant of time, and if that which is in locomotion is always occupying such a space, what's all that? Yeah. Sorry. Starting right here. And if that which is in locomotion is always occupying such a space at any moment, the flying arrow is therefore motionless at that instant of time and the next instant of time. But if both instants of time are taken as the same instant or continuous instants of time, then it is in motion. What's he saying there? So we've got our arrow here, flying through the air. You with me? Now, I'm plotting time right here. Now we're going to look at one instant of time. So here's time. At this instant of time, how much does the arrow move in a single instant? Zero. Doesn't Zero. Matter. It doesn't. At a single instant of time, the arrow is occupying this exact space right there. At that instant of time, right? Okay. Now, take the very next instant of time. Since during this instant of time, the arrow doesn't move, take the instant of time right next to it. The arrow still hasn't moved. What so take this instant of time. How much does it move in this instant? It doesn't. Take the very next instant of time. So we had this instant of time. The arrow didn't move. Go to the next instant of time. Well, the arrow didn't move going from this instant to this instant. What do you mean by next instant of time? The next instant of time. You got this instant and you got the one right next to it. <laughs> Wait, it's continuous. It's not discrete. No, it's not discrete. So there is no next instant. You made, are correct. The mistake you made. There is mistake. no next instant time. It's a bad concept. Uh, okay. All right. So you've got this instant time. Take the next instant time. In the next instant time, since the arrow didn't move through the first instant, when we get to the second instant time, it must still be in the same place. Mm -hmm. no. Yes. Does it move? The first instant time. How much does an arrow move in instant time? It doesn't. So go to the next instant of time. So through the first instant of time, it didn't move. So by the time we start our next instant of time, the arrow still hasn't moved. And you can do that for the next instant, and the next instant, and the next instant. And so through all these instants of time, the arrow doesn't move. And yet, if an arrow is moving, it must be making progress over every instant of time. And so it makes no progress over every instant of time, and yet it must be making progress over every instant of time. So it both is and is not making progress if it's moving at all. How do we fix this all together? The arrow isn't moving. Well, his logic is wrong. Well, yeah, his fundamental flaw is thinking that there is a next instant well, of time. What if you say take any instant of time and it's not moving? Okay. So name any instant so of time. So take this instant of time and the arrow's not moving in that instant of time. When is it moving? When is it moving? It's never it's moving. <laughs> it's never moving in an instant of time. It's moving from instant to instant. Doesn't he also argue that there's no such thing as two contiguous instances of time? Instant, instant. So it can't be moving between those. No, no. There is no two contiguous instances of time. Yeah, so take any instant of time and it's not. So moving. pick this instant of time. In that instant of time, the arrow does not move. Yes. Correct. Pick any other instant of time. 
In that instant time, the arrow does not move. Yes. But from instant to instant, the arrow moves. Because there are instances of time. Because there. it's, I mean, I don't know how you want to model this. There Typically, we model time. it with uh, some sort of velocity. No. <laughs> so, anytime you have some interval of time, so now we have an interval of time, and when you have an interval of time, velocity happens over interval of times. It doesn't happen at a point, it happens over a velocity. It's kind of like you asking me, what's the area under a point? It doesn't exist. What's the area under this point? It doesn't exist. But as we go from point to point, we can connect it with an actual area. Now that has area. Turns out the math is almost identical. Okay. Okay. In this case, integrals, but yeah. Very closely related. Okay. So yes, you see the obvious problem with it, assuming that there is a next instant of time. There is no next instant of time. Let's just make sure we make that perfectly clear. What's the problem of this logic? It's kind of like asking for what's the number that comes after zero? What, what's the number that comes after zero? One. One comes after zero, right? What about one half? Mm -hmm. I want to know the number that comes right after zero. What's the next number? One quarter. One quarter? What about eight? Or sixteen. <laughs> exactly. What's the next number? It's the one that's arbitrarily close to zero. There is no next number. In other words, let's prove it. Assume x is a number that comes after zero. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. So in other words, what do we know so far? x is greater than zero because it comes after zero, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Then we know that zero is less than x halves is less than x. Yeah. We found a number between zero and x. So x is not the number after zero. Here's a smaller number. You can always find a smaller number between your number and zero. Mm -hmm. So you're literally proving the point. There is no instant time that's moving. <laughs> <laughs> no, his, he is trying to say, where is it? Take the next instant of time, both instances of time taken as the same instant or continuous instant of time. He's trying to talk about one instant of time and the next instant of time right next to each other. Okay, Which is so an invalid concept if you represent time as continuous numbers. Don't think about his argument. Think about the argument. Take any instant of time. Okay. How, so, when is it moving? Ever. We you say all those motion of time. is not a concept that you can apply to an instant of time. The same way that area under is not a concept that you can apply to a point. If you talk about a curve, I can now talk about the area under. If you talk about between instants of time, I can talk about motion. Just two. If you want to talk about that concretely, we can actually talk about motion at an instant time. It's called its derivative. Or and that's a perfectly valid concept, but I didn't want to bring that in. Okay. <laughs> is there a time rule here? Very possible. Probably. I it is, is in motion. Normally, I overlook the law. Where? <laughs> On that same line, you just wiped out. As the same instance or continuous instant of time. Oh, there's no time rule in this. This is a copy paste of his argument. <laughs> and it is in motion. Yeah. Right, he's saying it both is and isn't in motion. He's saying on the one hand, look at one instance at a time, it's not moving. Look at the next instance at a time, it's not moving. On the other hand, since it's in motion, it is moving from instant to instant. So if you assume the object is moving, it both is and isn't moving. If you assume it's not moving, we don't have this problem. <laughs> this problem only arises if you try to assume the arrow's moving. That's what Zeno's showing. If you assume the opposite of what Parmenides says, you get all these absurdities. Oh, I see. So That's what he's showing over right. and over again. <laughs> right. People went and took Parmenides' argument and showed they led to absurdities. That made him angry. And so he went and showed that taking the opposite of Parmenides' positions leads to even worse absurdities. So Parmenides is the less of two absurdities. So Parmenides is the less absurd of two absurdities. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Denseness paradox. If there are many things, there must be as many as there are, and neither more nor less than that. But if there are as many as they are, they would be limited. If there are many things, or if there are many, things that are things that are are unlimited to ours. For there are always others between the things that are, and again, others between those. And so the things that are 
are in limited. So what's he arguing here? So Parmenides thought there was only one thing. You want to say no, there's more than one thing. How many things do you want to say then? So if there are many things, there must be some definite number of things. And a, a billion, a trillion, a hundred, hundred, hundred trillion, 10 to the 97,000, whatever it is. If there are many things, there must be some definite number of things. However, pick any two things. Here's two separate things. There must exist something between them. If there's nothing between them, they're not two separate things, they're one thing. So pick two things, there must be something between them. Otherwise you didn't pick two things, you pick the same thing. So, is he saying that so if there's two things, there must be something between them. Is he Here's two things, there must be something between them. Here's two things, there must be something between them. So if you try to say there's some definite number of things in the universe, then you're led to conclude there's an infinite number of things in the universe. Say you think there's just two things in the universe. If you think there's two things in the universe, what's between those two things? You can't say nothing, because then there would have really been one thing. So there must be something between them. And now we have three things in the universe. And what about between those two? Since those are two separate things, now there's a fourth thing, and a fifth thing, and a sixth thing, and a seventh thing. So they're just both finite and infinite things. Right. So if you assume that there's more than one, Parmenides said there's one. You want to say differently, however many you want to say there is, I show at least an absurdity. There both is that many, and there's not that many. Why can't you say there's infinite? Therefore, there's only one. You can say there's infinite. There's an infinite amount of things. If there's an infinite amount, then there's just one thing. So, this doesn't work for arguing against the infinite. He's arguing that if there are some number of things out there, he must have had particular arguments in mind that he's addressing these two. But so you can't say that the universe has some number of things more than one. Understand that this time, infinite, indefinite, and boundless are all kind of mixed concepts to each other. So if you said, well, there's some unknown number of things, it's kind of like the same thing as saying infinite. And so you say, it doesn't matter what the unknown is, however many it is is how many it is. I just phrased it some definite number to help you understand the argument. He doesn't use that terminology. He says, if there are many, there must be as many as there are. So he's... And neither more nor less than that. No, because you can have it in things. Right, you see, the, you see the bad logic in the argument. Yeah. This doesn't roll out infinities. But they don't have a good concept of infinity yet. Oh, Not a bad concept yet. So in their mind, infinity, boundless, and indefinite are all mixed up together. So he's pretty much saying, because air is touching this desk, desk and air are the same. He is, there is no separate air and desk. There's just being. Yeah, well, the same thing. Then we yes, there's see. just being. Everything is just being. First, first. We're just going back to what? He, he's said. only arguing for Parmenides. He is not claiming anything original. He's not claiming anything new. He is simply defending his master. So he still is arguing for the one finite solid sphere of just being. That's what it is. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Uh, here's his argument for the universe uh, being finite in size. So here's why he thought the universe was finite in size. This one, we're missing some of this, so I didn't bother giving any of it. I'm just going to give you his argument. Here's how it roughly goes. Assume that the universe is a whole composed of parts. And consider the size of the universe, consider the size the universe must be, the size of the universe. The size the universe must be. Get rid of the other. Just erase it real quick. All right. If parts exist, they must have some magnitude. Otherwise, they don't exist. They have to have some size to them. Every magnitude is theoretically divisible without limit. And so if the universe has parts, it must have an infinite number of parts. Yeah. Then, since the universe has infinite parts, it must be infinite in size. No matter how small that part is, if you have an infinite number of them, you get infinity. Yeah. Okay. At the same time, however, consider the fundamental parts that the universe would be composed of. It's fundamental constituent parts. They can't be divided anymore. Do they exist? It's basic fundamental parts. Why, why would they exist? Exactly. So, since they are its fundamental components, they must be indivisible into further parts. 
Since any magnitude is divisible, then the fundamental components must have no magnitude. Thus, each of the fundamental parts has no size. And so the universe has no size. He's <laughs> proving himself wrong. No, he's proven that there are no components to the universe. Assume that the universe as a whole is composed of parts. He's proving that there are no fundamental parts. There is yes. no parts to the universe. There's it's all one, one solid, yeah. there it is, the universe. Why can't can't talk about any pieces of it. But can't you just divide the one? Yeah. <laughs> just divide it forever. <laughs> We'll follow his logic here for a second and then finish, or then I'll just hurt. So, what's he saying here? So, since any magnitude is divisible, then the fundamental components must have no size. Thus, each fundamental part has no size. And so the universe has no size. Take as many things as you want that have zero size and add them up. What do you get? Zero. Doesn't matter how many zeros you add up, you're left with zero. So the universe both is infinite in size and it has no size. Therefore, the universe has no parts. And it's just one universe. One solid thing. And now you say separate it. How do you separate the universe? If you try to separate it in the way you're thinking, so I get some of the universe here and some of the universe here, so now they're separate. What's here? More parts. Isn't that what you're No, but the universe has no parts. That's why you just tried to prove it. We just proved that the universe can't look like this. It can't be split into parts. Assuming there's not, there can't be, not be. If you can split the universe into parts, then you both get that the universe is infinite in size, and you get that the universe has no size. Impossible. Not divisible. Therefore, our universe is not divisible. It doesn't have parts. It's just one solid thing. <laughs> Right. So, so, so how do you prove it wrong? With like the turtle in the hair. <laughs> With the turtle in the hair, uh, so there's a lot of problems. So for example, one of the arguments that he made is, we'll go back to his arguing going over a path one. So he says, if you want to take the path, you must first go halfway. Yes. And then rather than cutting the half this way, I'm going to cut the half this way just because it helps you see it better. And then before you can get through this half, you must get through half of that, and then half of that, and then half of that, and then half of that. And we can keep doing this if we get an infinite number of distances. And adding up an infinite number of distances, no matter how small, gives you infinity, right? Yes. And the answer is no. This distance right here is one half, plus this distance is one fourth, plus this distance is one eighth, plus this distance is one sixteenth, etc. dot, dot, dot. And the sum of all these is actually one. And so it turns out, if we we're talking about meters here, you just go one meter. It doesn't add up to infinity, it adds up to one. Well, did you prove this in your discrete class? Okay. You can still move. You can't get to that half, the half, the half, the half, the half. The half, the half. You can never start. Sure you can. You just did it. Let's say you're going exactly one meter per second. Then you cover this half in exactly one half a second. And you cover this fourth in exactly well, one half a second. Well, how do you get to the half, the half? You use the fourth of the, you use the half of the half of the half of the half of the second, and you so and you have this pairing up of seconds to the interval that you cover with that second, and all the time that you use up is exactly one second, and all the distances you cover is exactly one meter, and so over the course of one second you go exactly one meter. You're going one meter per second. Yeah. How do you start? We're going to draw the picture this way to help you see that. You up your butt. <laughs> We're going to look now at the picture this way to help with the intuition. Okay. You with me? Yes. So this half of the meter that you go first, okay. you use what I'm going to do. Here's your distances. You use one half of a second to do that. You can't start. <laughs> we don't. We can evaluate an infinite sum with a limit. You're using limits is what you're doing. And so you don't need to find the first one to be able to add them all up. All right, just pick one. You can do an infinite sum without taking an infinite amount of time to calculate each of the pieces. And so we don't need to do each piece one at a time. We can calculate an infinite sum all in one go and evaluate. 
So we don't care what the first distance is that you cover. Mathematically, just picture that. <laughs> <laughs> he's using math to explain it, so we're using math to disprove it. No, he's using physics. Like, you can't all cross that distance. Well, you get a bigger problem if you want to talk about this using modern physics. Because the notion of distance breaks down when we start talking about distances smaller than one plane. One plane. Yeah. The notion of a distance smaller than that is a bad notion. It doesn't exist. What? Yeah. We're not going to go down that path. So it is, is that like an actual like measurement, though? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Isn't point the smallest? Theoretically. It is the smallest unit under which distance still makes sense. Uh, entirely. It just, it's entirely theoretical. What is that use? I remember talking about it. Huh? When would you ever use it? You would use it in quantum mechanics. That's, it's what the quanta in quantum mechanics is referring to in a bunch of different places. It seems like there's these discrete quantities that our physical universe operates by. For example, when an electron jumps up an energy level, it, the electron is here and then the electron is here. It doesn't travel from here to there through space. That's not what the model says. The electron's here, then it's here. Interesting. And it only exists at these very specific quantities. That's where the quanta in quantum mechanics comes from. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Well, it actually comes from the photoelectric effect with photons coming in very discrete sizes. Yeah. But I, think, I remember talking about Planck's size. Huh? Long is long is oh, long 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 I don't know the number. But a meter is way, 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 way bigger of a Planck length than the entire observable universe is to a meter. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. It's tiny. <laughs> scaling down, we go much smaller of orders of magnitude than we get scaling up, going to larger orders of magnitude. Really? Yes. Really? So as far as distance is going in our universe, we're on the large end of the spectrum. That's you want to get in the middle end of the spectrum, you got to go somewhere on sub subatomic level. Really? I'm not sure what the middle of the spectrum would be. Probably somewhere with a proton. Kind of makes sense. <laughs> so, that's crazy. That's is it infinitely small? Worth playing. So All we <laughs> have are models. And our models break down when we talk about distances smaller than that. The, we don't. Yeah. Should we? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole video on YouTube that you showed me. Was it YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. With the Heisenberg yeah. uncertainty principle and explaining it. It has to come with the fact that our universe is very physical place, and you have to think carefully about what's actually happening. Yeah, you know say that that talking about the zeros and then a one. I remember trying not to listen. Oh, not to <laughs> that's a good one. Anyways. That's a plank. Oh, point oh 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 thirty five times and then one. Okay. Will you really quick Google uh, the size of the observable universe? It's thirteen point seven billion times. In terms of meters. It should just give it to the meters. Uh, 26. 10, 10 to the 26. Yeah. Oh, so you wow. see, <laughs> way smaller than yeah. this is big. One of those oh, that's is insane. insane. That's this is a billion times smaller than this is big. <laughs> 27 is ridiculously smaller than... That's right, crazy. but these are still just absurdly small and absurdly massive. Like, no intuition for what those numbers even are. What do we think is outside of our current? This is just another universe. Sorry, what? What do you think is outside our current observable universe? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Outside More observable universe. universe. Non -being. Non -being. <laughs> non -being. The observable. Outside the observable universe, I think, is more universe. The current model for the universe. I'm, like, what, what's the material of the, uh, the exact same stuff that's the material here, I would guess. The observable universe is different than the universe. Okay. It's just what we can see. Yeah, observable universe is parts of the universe that light has had time to travel to our eyes from. Okay. Then I meant to say the universe. So, so really talking true. about outside the universe might be a broken concept. Yes. Uh -huh. It might even be circular. We don't know. Well, that's the current theory. So if you want our current model for what the universe is like, uh -huh. here's a way that Parmenides might have been onto something. If he thought that the universe is like the surface of a sphere, turns out that's pretty close to the best analogy we can give for it right now. So if you want to think about our current universe, you need to think about mapping three dimensions down into two-dimensional space. So we gotta get comfortable with thinking about two-dimensional beings for a second. Okay. So here's two-dimensional Donnie, here's two-dimensional James. 
two-dimensional Donnie and two-dimensional James have an argument. James goes into his bedroom, and he takes the door, which was open, and he slams it shut. Yep. I'm now right. Donnie cannot see James. <laughs> now Chandler, this three-dimensional being, who has an ability to communicate with us, he, can see he explains to James, Perfect. James, I still see you. <laughs> <laughs> and James says, uh -uh. do you see me from this way? As James points that way. And Chandler says, no. You say, oh, do you see me from this way? Chandler says, no. Do you see me from this way? Chandler says, no. Do you see me from this way? Chandler says, no. You say, which way do you see me from? I see why you're saying it. And what does Chandler say? Uh, direction he can't uh, up. Yeah. That way. This is a concept in Chandler's head. Out. Okay. Or in. These are all the dimensions we know. We know how to go left and right. We know how to go forward and backwards. Yeah. If we were beings on some four-dimensional chalkboard. We couldn't see the fifth dimension. So there we are. We are now beings, three-dimensional beings on a four-dimensional chalkboard. Mm -hmm. And some four-dimensional beings are talking about silly us. And I think that James can't see my, inside my intestines. Mm -hmm. They can. <laughs> they can see inside my intestines, my lungs, everywhere I go, where I think I've walked off every direction. Which way do they see it from? <laughs> that way? That, that way? Sense. Which way? <laughs> the way you can't point up. <laughs> well, Look that way. Or pointing through time. If time was half of the fourth dimension. Well, time travels in the fourth dimension, but that can be misleading. So, <laughs> giving you some intuition, so now give you uh, some intuition for our model of the universe and the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. So the best way we can think about our universe currently is mapping it all onto the surface of a sphere. Mm -hmm. Alright? So like the surface of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Not the Earth, the, just the surface of the Earth. So now we're beings that only exist on the surface of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Someone might ask you a question like, where's the center of the surface of the Earth? Not the center of the Earth. Where's the center of the surface of the Earth? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It's a bad concept. Similarly, talking about the center of the universe, bad concept. Yeah, right. We are a three-dimensional surface of a four-dimensional sphere. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Is the current analogy for what our universe is like. Mm -hmm. What that means is that, obviously, I can't do this. Just give me an analogy. It's possible, clear everything out of my way, I could look that way and see the back of my own head. Right? Mm -hmm. Not really, because I can't travel like that. <laughs> way too much distance. But if I go that way long enough, stop the universe is expanding, and I march that way long enough, I'll eventually get back where I started. Yeah, right. The same way that if you're on the Earth, and you keep going east, what? you eventually get back where you started. So what's That's real? Right. That's real. That's our current model. It's a model. Oh. It's our current model. This is our best guess at how the universe actually is. Yeah, no, they're probably the dumbest these guys when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> probably so, so far away. <laughs> Here we are. Donnie's like, class is recorded. <laughs> they're going to be laughing a thousand years from down the road. <laughs> they actually thought this. Yeah, you know, simple-minded fools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think more respect for these guys. And then, so the notion of the Big Bang now. So we exist and the surface, we are a three-dimensional surface on a four-dimensional sphere. So I pretend it's a four-dimensional balloon. Now that balloon is expanding. Mm -hmm. That's what we mean by the universe is expanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if we pick two dots on the balloon and we look at them, here's two points on the balloon at one point when the balloon looks like this. At some future point, the balloon looks like this, and so those points now look like this. And so it looks like they're moving apart. But what's really happening is space is growing between them. Right. We literally measure the, the surface of the balloon. Uh, based off of the light being stretched. Right. Yes. Through this effect. Which is mind blowing. Yes. Through the Doppler effect on light coming from distant galaxies. Based off of how redshifted it is, we can get its relative velocity to us. Hmm. Now we assume that the galaxies aren't actually moving apart. And so it's space going between them. Because it's very weird that every galaxy seems to be moving away from us. Right. What are the odds? It seems more likely that space is growing between us and them. And the fact that light doesn't uh, change, and yet it is changing. <laughs> so light, okay. so since, imagine now you're an ant on a balloon, trying to move from point A to point B. 
If the balloon is small enough as I'm blowing it up, you can still get from point A to point B. But once it gets big enough, if I keep expanding it at the same rate, there's gonna come a point where it's expanding faster than the ant can move to the next dot. The distance between the two dots can be growing faster than the ant moves. All the line Similarly, galaxies far enough apart will eventually be moving away from each other fast enough, space will be growing between them fast enough, that light cannot travel from point A to point B. And, that's it's it's over years. and we are currently seeing objects that technically we cannot see their current state. They are now far enough away from us that we can no longer see light from them. We're still seeing the light that they emitted billions of years ago. But, we know they're but once it's all caught up, we can't see its current light. It's now too far. So there's objects in the sky you can currently see that is impossible, even if you can travel at the speed of light, to reach. There's still, well, I guess they're not there anymore. I mean, <laughs> they're somewhere else in that the there has changed. <laughs> the there's gone. Uh, Positioned okay. relative, so, so you can say it how you want. Yeah. Yeah, just Anyways, let's cover this last of the Eleatics, uh, Melesis. Melesis, not particularly interesting. Uh, he pretty much thought the same thing as uh, Parmenides. He disagreed with him on three counts. One, he thought the universe was actually infinite in size. Two, he thought that the universe was eternal in the sense that... Uh, it has no beginning and end and goes through an infinite amount of time. Isn't that what Parmenides thought? No, Parmenides thought that there is no time. It's eternal in the sense that it's timeless. It experiences no time. He thinks it's eternal as in it experiences an infinite amount of time. And then, finally, he thinks that the universe is incorporeal. It's not physical. It's all imaginary. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Now, he actually uses bad arguments, so he's a good example of uh, misusing logic. All right, so while he's from Samos, we include him with the Eleatic since he followed Parmenides and he moved to Elia, became an, became an Eleatic. He was active in the Samian Wars. That's how we're able to uh, date him. Did I put a map on here? Oh, I put it here. Thank goodness. Okay, Samian Wars, kind of jumping ahead in history a little bit. So... Jumping ahead, surprise, surprise, Athens wins the greco persian Wars. We'll cover the greco persian Wars next week. When Athens wins the greco persian Wars, pretty much everything you see in yellow ends up coming under Athens' influence. In particular, you have Samos here and Miletus here. Now, Samos and Miletus, all through history, have been rivals competing with each other. They're both under Athens' influence. These two have a problem. They end up going to war with each other, fighting each other. Athens tells them to knock it off. Samos is the one winning the fight, so they say no. And so Athens ends up going to war with Samos. And that's the Samian Wars. Interesting. So jump ahead in history a little bit there. Anyways, that's our best way to dig it. So he was active in the Samian Wars and led the Samian fleet to a victory against the Athenians. Now... <laughs> Uh, he agreed with Parmenides about the nature of the universe, except on three counts. The universe is infinite in size as opposed to finite. The universe is eternal as in existing through an infinite amount of time rather than existing in a timeless present. And then finally, the universe is incorporeal. It is not a physical thing. Incorporeal. Thank you. Incorporeal. Okay. Example of one of the fragments, only going to give you one of these, outside of that we're going to go over his arguments. If nothing is, what can be said of it as something real? What was, was ever, and ever shall be. For, if it had come into being, it needs must have been nothing before it came into being. Now, if it were nothing, it would no wise could be, could, sorry, it no wise could anything have arisen out of nothing. All right, weird fragments. Sounds a little bit like Parmenides. You already get his Parmenides being feel here. Let's get into his argument. In other words, the one, as he's going to refer to it later, did not come to be. That's what he's saying there. We said his arguments are very similar to Parmenides. From here on out, I'll just give summaries of his arguments. We won't bother giving his actual premise. And we'll go over a bunch of his different proofs. So one of the proofs that he gives, he proves that the one being is eternal. How does this proof go? Whatever comes to be must have a beginning. 
whatever comes to be must have had a beginning. The one did not come to be. That's what he argues for in that one fragment. Therefore, the one does not have a beginning. Therefore, the one extends eternally into the past. Now, notice what he's doing here. He's using bad logic that is used all the time. He starts out saying, alpha implies beta. And he's saying, therefore, not alpha implies not beta. Which do not say the same thing. Let me give you intuition for this here. Right. Let's say alpha is fire, beta is oxygen. Fire implies oxygen. If there's fire, there's oxygen, right? Yep. That is not the same thing as no fire implies no oxygen. There's no fire here. I'm breathing just fine. So these are two very different things. Alpha implies beta is not the same thing as not alpha implies not beta. What about not beta implies not? That's contrapositive. That is valid. Okay. So he's saying what comes to be must have a beginning. So alpha is what comes to be. If it comes to be, it must have a beginning. The one does not. Oh. The one did not come to be. The one did not come to be. So now he's saying we have not beta. Or not alpha. What comes to be must have a beginning. The one did not come to be. Therefore, the one did not have a beginning. Bad logic. Easy logic to fall prey to when you're not paying attention. So he's a good example simply for that. <laughs> he's an example of bad logic. Don't let him trick you. This time, it's not in his premises or anything like that. It's in the actual logic itself is invalid. So we'll try another one. Same type of bad argument. Whatever has a beginning must also have an end. The one did not have a beginning. Therefore, the one will not have an end. Therefore, the one extends eternally into the future. Why can't you begin and then just go on forever? Just giving you his argument. Good. Yeah. Next. Proof that what is is unlimited. He ultimately calls this what is the one. One of his proofs is going to be what is is one, and then he starts calling it the one. <laughs> so, so far it's just what is. He eventually calls it the one, so I start calling it the one prematurely. Proof that what is is unlimited. So here's where he's arguing that the universe is infinite in size. Though what is is eternal. We already proved that. And so it has no beginning or end. Whatever has a beginning and end is limited. What is has no beginning and end, and therefore it is unlimited. He's making an argument from it being eternal in time to it being eternal in space. Doesn't work. Lots of bad logic here, but that's how his argument goes. It's more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> what is is eternal, and so it doesn't have a beginning or end. Whatever has a beginning and an end is limited. What is has no beginning and end, and therefore is unlimited. And therefore, our universe is infinite. It's the same bad logic. <laughs> it's the same bad logic, but he's also conflating eternal and infinite in time with infinite in space. Doesn't work. All right, everything is one. And then so finally we talk about the one. So proof that everything is one. What is is unlimited, and so is temporally unlimited. It exists everywhere in time. Therefore, Anything else that exists temporally exists at the same time as it, what is. So what is exists everywhere in time. If anything else exists in time, it exists at the same time as what is. Okay. Therefore, what is, is coexists temporally with all things. No, not yet. We're going to get there. So far, if anything exists at the same time as, sorry, if anything else exists, so we have what is. If anything else exists, it must coexist at least in time with what is. Yeah, right. We're going to also argue it has to coexist in space, and therefore everything is the one. <laughs> okay. What is is unlimited, and so is spatially unlimited. Therefore, anything else that exists at the same time exists in the same space as what is. So if I'm what is, and I take up all space, and you exist at the same time as me, you must coexist with me in space. And so since I exist at all time, then anything else that exists must coexist with me in space. So anything that exists eventually coexists with me. And so everything is me. And all is one. Yeah. That's what he's saying there. So then what is coexists with all things at all time. And so what is is one. Therefore, the one is everything, and everything is the one. 
<laughs> Got that one? Yeah, that's <laughs> wrong. Yeah. Logic is everywhere the same. <laughs> Proof that one is everywhere the same. Yes. <laughs> if what is had qualitative differences, some parts that were different from other parts, it has parts that can be distinguished. So if there was a red part and a green part, then now there's two parts. If there's some qualitative difference from one part to the next part, then there must be two parts that you can distinguish between. So if what is has qualitative differences, it has parts that can be distinguished. Whatever has parts is plural and is not one. However, we already proved that what is is one. Then what is has no qualitative differences. So as I go from space to space in this one, it must all be the exact same. So he's arguing it's this oneness of just solid being, just like Parmenides. The only difference is it's infinite. There's no difference between this part of being and this part of being. This part of the one and this part of the one. There's no qualitative differences. There's no space that's harder than another space. There's no space that's a different color from another space. That's what he means by no qualitative differences there. You got the argument? Yeah. Okay. Therefore, the one is everywhere the same. The one is changeless. So, proof that the one is changeless. Whatever undergoes change is altered. Right? Whatever is altered is not unified or whole. Alteration implies becoming what it wasn't. So, it's no longer one thing unified. If I change something, it's no longer what it was. So it's different from what it was. So it's not the same thing. So it's not unified. It's not the one. <laughs> but you can't have that. But you can't have that. The one is unified and whole. Therefore, the one does not undergo any type of change. Okay. Now, finally, he's using some good logic, even though his argument is that. Alpha implies beta is the same thing as not beta implies not alpha. Yeah, right. He says what undergoes change is altered. So here he's saying change implies altered. And so he's change implies altered. Whatever is altered is not unified or whole. Oh, wait, this is what he's going to say. Sorry. He's saying altered implies not one. But since the universe is one, that implies not altered. Right. And this is valid logic. Yeah, right. Different from what he was doing before. So yay, we got some good logic, even though we may not like the argument. Just to help it filter your intuition, fire, in, fire in, I'm going to use alpha for fire, B for oxygen again, just so you can see that these two say the same thing. So fire implies oxygen says the same thing as no oxygen implies no fire. Fire implies oxygen is the same thing as no oxygen implies no fire. They say the same thing. So that was valid logic. Proof that the one is motionless. Here's a problem. To be empty is to be nothing. That's what empty is. It's nothing. <laughs> what is nothing? does not exist. <laughs> the one exists, therefore, the one is not empty. Okay, so it's not empty. Well, if it's not empty, what is it? It must be full. <laughs> therefore, the one is full. Whatever has motion is not full. You can only move if there's somewhere to go. You need emptiness to move into. No, you don't. It's possible to just have a perfect swirling of mass. Oh, shoot, that's true. So, no, you don't need emptiness to move into. But, following the argument, whatever has motion is not full. There must be empty space to move into. Whatever is full must be motionless. <laughs> Therefore, the one is motionless. Because it's full. Because it's not empty. Because it's not empty. <laughs> <laughs> so, not the most sophisticated argument. No. But good for analyzing logic. Proof, here's the one word one. Proof that the one is incorporeal. Incorporeal. That's what I want to say, incorporeal. All right, the one is whole. It is only one thing. Since it is whole, it has no parts. Since it has no parts, it has no thickness. 
Since it has no thickness, it has no body. Therefore, the one is incorporeal. <laughs> incorporeal. What does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean by thickness? Incorporeal means it has no physical substance to it. The way you imagine a ghost. How do we know what physical A ghost is incorporeal. There's yeah. nothing physical to it. How do we know? That's no part. How do we know what physical yes. substance is? Nothing is physically yeah. sub is, uh, is a physical substance. Just that was just me giving you intuition for this word. That's not his definition. He's saying everything doesn't have a body. Right? He's saying, look, if something is whole, it has no parts. Yes. Okay. If there's no parts to something, then there's no thickness to it. Okay. Get rid of all your parts. What's left? Nothing. That's what he's saying. Right. The universe has no parts. So he's saying there's nothing. So whatever it is, is no physical thing. So how do we know what physical things are? How do you know what physical things are? How do you know about nothing if you've never seen it before? It's an increased correct perception. If, if there's no physical parts, then how do we comprehend what a physical part is? We are just following the logic of the argument. If it's whole, it has no parts. What does it mean to have no parts? Your whole hands are whole. No thickness. <laughs> <laughs> no thickness. You're not taking any space. Yeah. If I get rid of all your parts, what's left of you? You're not taking any space. It doesn't have Some power. spaceless use. But it, the whole is one part. What? You're infinite, so you're taking the most space. He's just, since yeah. it holds the toll, it has no parts. The whole and the part and seem to be contradicting terms. <laughs> yeah. it, doesn't a part have to be a piece of the whole? And yet, if you get rid of all yeah, parts, what do you the have? The whole, which is the you one. see all the confusion yeah. Yeah. in the argument. Yeah. Good. That's the one thing that's real. <laughs> <laughs> but, so there's this argument. Therefore, the one is incorporeal. No, he might be with Zenophanes here, and somehow the one is God and God is the one. Maybe. Or he might be like uh, really later thinkers. Ah, we'll see much, much later minus thinkers who think all of reality exists just in your mind. And it's incorporeal. It's not physical. And later thinkers will actually think this. It's all just in your mind. Where does your mind exist? Oneness. So he's not... He's not advocating positions that aren't held by a lot of people. A lot of people believe these things. They might not accept this particular argument, but they do accept the conclusions. Well, not, a lot of people believe there is no separation, uh, like that, that reality is an illusion, and all these different things. Right, you'll notice that early Greek thought resembles a lot of modern mysticism. That's a, that should be a, a big, bad sign that we have not progressed this argument. Well, you're going to have a hard time defining progression. Yeah, and you're also going to have to have a hard time disproving what these guys are saying. Anyways, so there we go. We have now finished the Ionian school, and we have finished the Italian school. So a recap of the Ionian and Italian philosophers. Let's make sure we remember them all. Thales, he thought the one stuff was water. Yes. Anaximander, he thought it was a pyramid. Anaximenes, air. Xenophanes, earth, water, or God? Gotcha. Right? He was a religious one. Yeah. Heraclitus, fire, the logos, or change? <laughs> Four elements. Yeah. And then there was the avatar. <laughs> Some argue it's that. <laughs> Some argue it's that. Pythagoras, he thought it was always number. Yeah. Everything's composed of number. Parmenides, being Zeno, being Melesis, the one. He could have thought being two, just wanted to differentiate that he has a a little bit different notion than these guys. Yeah. The one is being so, nothing. The one is being nothing. <laughs> He's distinguishing between nothing and incorporeal. Uh -huh. So you said there's an actual conversation between Socrates and Parmenides? There seems to have been an actual conversation that took place in history between Socrates, Parmenides, and Zeno. So are we doing Socrates next? The Socrates no, no, no. Is we got a ways to go. 470. Yes. His birth is 470. 470 BC. Socrates' birth is. Right. So that's five years after his flora. This is when he was flourishing. Okay. So he, oh, lived, he dies 30 to 40 years after this, uh -huh. and he was born 30 to 40 years before this ish. And does Socrates have any conversations with Zeno or 
Socrates has a conversation with Parmenides and Zeno at the same time. Oh, nice. That's so that's the conversation covered in Plato's dialogue, the Parmenides. Okay. Now that's not an actual historical conversation, but the consensus is, is that the conversation actually took place and then Plato is just fabricating the topic right. to some extent. Because largely what Parmenides is doing, Plato uses a Parmenides to ridicule his own philosophy. It's where he's attacking his own philosophy in the dialogue. Mm. And so he's using Parmenides as a mouthpiece for doing that. Mm. Gotcha. So that's what's happening in the dialogue. But no, we still have to cover the pluralists, the atomists, and then the sophists. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll get to Socrates. Socrates. So but before we do that, next week we're going to start by going over the Greece Persian Wars. Okay. We got to hurry up and catch up in our history now because our philosophers are past what we've talked about so far. Okay. So a lot of these guys are pretty contemporary. Yeah. Yes. Yes, their lives all overlap with each other. And we kind of got to go start at some date and then follow his thinking through and then reset, start at another date and follow their thinking through. Yeah. And so we kind of got to that over and over again. So we are kind of jumping back and forth in the timeline here. Trying to cover schools of thought at a time, mm -hmm. rather than actually be completely in order, because then we'd be jumping back and forth between ideas. There's a philosopher that thought all the elements were fighting each other. <laughs> Max Mander. That's what I thought. Max Mander is the one who thought all four elements were at war with each other, and they're all competing to somehow convert the elements into each other, and through that strife, everything's kept in balance. Right. Heraclitus also thought that to some degree, it appears. Anything else? All right, so see you guys next week. Thank you. Yep.